going to talk to you today a little bit about the intersection of science, education, and conservation, specifically uh, what we do at the Virginia Zoo. And I just want to say that when they initially reached out to me, it was you know, said, do you have someone who is in STEM who can talk to teachers? And a lot of times, I think we all get this, a lot of you as teachers, you know, I said, well, I do. And people say, oh, you, you're STEM. Well, I am. And I come to my profession as the education manager here at the zoo in a little bit of a roundabout way. So I figured the best way to talk to you about my kind of career path was to walk you through it. So that's what I'm going to do a little bit today. So as we start, and yes, that is me with the cheetah cub because that is one of the very great perks of my job. Um, so I have degrees in environmental science, biology and a master's degree in biology. I initially went into things full force on STEM. Um, I went straight through seven, eight years of school, I think it was, and did work on um, the ecology of rare plants in Florida. And um, I went straight on through and then I kind of got a little burnt out, I'm going to admit, on some of the research aspects of things. And so I went in and became an environmental educator. And I started out in a state park in North Carolina. And then I continued on. Um, I've worked for the Audubon Society. I've worked for a nonprofit called Living Classrooms in um, DC. I've worked for the Department of Energy and the Environment in DC out of their Aquatic Resources Education Center um, and here at the Virginia Zoo. And I skipped one, you might notice. I was also a transportation ecologist and ecology team leader at the Georgia Department of Transportation. And you're going to say, what does that have to do with environmental education? And how did this happen? And that's where my sort of twist and turn of my career go. Um, and I'm going to get there. But I promise you, I'm going to tie them all together because they all work perfectly into what I do now here at the zoo. So first off, where do informal science educators work? Because that's really as environmental educator, that's what I call myself, an informal science educator everywhere. Um, so basically, if you are doing any sort of an education at an institution or like a, um, the aquarium, the botanic garden, the government has them, nonprofits, um, state parks, national parks, zoos. If you are outside the classroom, you're generally considered an informal science educator. And just kind of a thought, I want you guys to think as we go through this, if you've used informal science educators in your classroom, because I bet you have. Um, and I'm looking through some names and a couple of them sound familiar, so I may have actually talked to one or two of you before. Um, so what does an informal science educator do? And we do a lot. Here at the zoo, we teach about science. So we teach about uh, the animals at the zoo, but we do more than just that. We also do interpretation, which is really building that connection between the people and our resources, which are, for us, our animals. We create the lesson plans. We also create signage. At the zoo, I am in charge of fact-checking all of the signs that we put out um, to make sure that they are correct. And also our department works on making sure that they're cohesive and that they are uh, leading you to learn about what we're trying to have you learn about. Um, I also, there's a little dollar sign out there. I have to go after grants and money um, to make these programs happen just as I know a lot of you do and a lot of you will fund programs like mine to come into your classrooms. Um, so we do a lot of that. And then what kind of a background does an informal science educator need? Uh, so this is where a lot of people in my field come with my kind of background. I didn't have a formal teaching degree. I didn't go through and take a pedagogy class um, or do any of that. I had that background in science, but then I also had a passion for it. Um, and so a lot of us come from that, um, but we also have to be 
that outgoing personality, that person who wants to talk to you, who wants to connect with the kids. Um, I think sometimes you think of that scientist as that person in the lab coat who doesn't want to interact with people. Um, and there are far more of us who really do and become that educator. Um, and then what does education, informal science education, look like at the Virginia Zoo today? And it looks like camp. It looks like events. Um, we have our Zubu coming up and we'll be having our educators out doing chats at the animals. Um, it looks like classrooms coming in. It looks like scout programs and toddler programs and interacting with animals on our zoo live stage. It's kind of all over. And then something for um, especially my high school teachers is how do you get a job in informal or environmental education? And here I've got for you a couple resources and some job boards that you can go to. And that's a great way to look at what's out there. Um, the AZA is the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. And that has not just education jobs, but all jobs available in zoo and aquariums on it. Um, so that's a great place for if you've got kids who are really interested in that. And you don't even have to love science. You don't have to be a keeper to work at a zoo. Um, and I can talk about that at another time because we also do stuff talking about careers, but just some resources for you. Um, and then I promised that I would get back to this for you. Uh, so back to the transportation ecologist position. Um, and I apologize if some of this is a little base level for some of you, but I found that when I've talked before, um, not everybody knows what an ecologist is or does. So I'm gonna go through some of that to start with. Um, so an ecologist is someone who studies the interrelationships between organisms and their environment. And where do they work? They actually work everywhere too. Um, so universities, research institutions, museums, zoos, aquariums, like myself. Uh, they work at nonprofits, state and local government, private, con um, federal government as well, and private consultants as well. Um, and as a transportation ecologist, when I worked for the Department of Transportation, our goal was to avoid and minimize impacts to ecological resources. And those resources include things like streams, open waters, wetlands, and protected species in their habitats. So these are all of the things that are regulated in some manner, whether it's by the state or it could be by the federal government. Um, and our job was to go out and identify what's there and then work with the designers in the Department of Transportation to make sure that we were avoiding and minimizing to the best of our ability. And then if we couldn't, we would mitigate that. Um, so I said I'm a field ecologist, but a lot of work is spent on the computer at first. You've got to do a lot of your background research. First, you need to know where the project is. And at the Department of Transportation, we would get road widenings, we would get bridge replacements, new roads, um, those four leaf clover interchanges that everyone hates. Yeah, we went out and we made sure that those went in too. Um, and any sort of project that would disturb soil, basically, um, was something that we would have to go and check, is there possibly a listed species? Is there a water? Is there something that we protect that we need to check on? Um, so a lot of very hard, yep, you can see my... Uh, Coworker Jamie down here was working very hard that day uh, with his feet up in his desk. Um, and then you've got to ground truth it. So you can't just rely on Google Maps. Yeah, there's a water there. No, there's not a water there. You've got to go out and actually identify it. Um, identify the wetlands, the streams, and the open waters. That means kind of a lake or a pond. Um, and then you're going to evaluate and document what sort of habitat there is and what potential for species for protected plants and animals, um, for what the government calls critical habitats, and then essential fish habitat, um, which is something that is regulated by the, uh, well, it's NIMFS, and I cannot for the life of me at this point think about what NIMFS stands for, um, National Marine Fisheries. 
that's where we go. Um, and then also because I was in the state of Georgia, the state of Georgia had protections on the buffers for a river or a stream as well. So you had to make sure um, if you were coming within 25 or 50 feet of that, because they're trying to make sure they're protecting to prevent erosion and sedimentation from coming into those waters. Um, and then we would also document the locations of invasive species. Um, and that was something that was helping scientists track the spread of that. Um, and then I'm just gonna give a couple of my favorite examples of some projects that I got to work on uh, while I was an ecologist. And the first one was we were doing a bridge replacement and you can probably see this bridge does not look great. It was, I wanna say, I don't have the math on it, but it was at least 80 to 100 years old in rural Georgia. It had not had the best wear and tear on it. It definitely did need to be replaced. Um, but while we were out surveying, we found that there was a state protected muscle on the bridge site. And so as we worked with the designers, we worked to um, figure out, okay, can we avoid this? Well, they were everywhere, so we couldn't avoid them entirely. So then we talked about, okay, how can we um, minimize that? And they decided that they would temporarily close the road so that they could just replace the bridge exactly where it was and not have to build a uh, temporary go around, which would disturb the water even more. And then we went out with the state biologist and actually picked up all the muscles we could find and relocated them. Um, and so we spent, it was a good long day out in the water, um, collecting all of the mussels that we could find, documenting them, and then all of the state protected species got moved upstream. Um, and then every year they actually go back and they document what's going on so they can tell what kind of an impact that bridge replacement may have had on those mussels and how that population that moved upstream is doing. And then um, bats on bridges. So it's not something a lot of people think about, but bridges are actually a fantastic habitat for bats. They um, have joints in them because you, you're, when you're made of concrete and you're dealing with weather, you've got to leave space for it to expand and contract. And so you have the joint in between. And a lot of times there's material stuffed up there, but it falls out. And so you've got this nice, perfect little hole, just the right size for a bat to make its home. Or in the case of this one, several thousand bats. Um, so it was, I think one of my pleasures to, but also um, utter disgust. So all of that black you see down there is guano. Um, and we estimated probably, I think it was 1500 bats at one point in time on this bridge. Um, and that's great for the bats. Um, and at that point when there are that many bats, we couldn't identify the multi-species. So we can't tell if one of them's a protected species or not. So we had to treat it like it was. Um, and a lot of times we were doing maintenance on these bridges. So it wasn't just a bridge replacement, it was maintenance. And when they do the maintenance, they are kind of refinishing the top. And when they do that, they're stripping everything down and putting it back over. And there's lots of vibration and noise and everything coming down from the top, which is not very great on those bats. Um, so in one particular instance, um, and this was also one of my favorite days, I got to go out um, on this machine um, where we had identified that there were bats, they were getting ready to do the work. And we actually, because we didn't know 100% what the work would do uh, to the bats, we were going to monitor um, while they were there doing the work, what was happening with the bats. Um, so we went out to um, check them out and that is me very, very, very high up there um, on this machine. Uh, and unfortunately that, well, I guess fortunately for the bats that day, they had already left so they could go ahead and do their work. Um, and we didn't have to remove them and relocate them that day um, or check out what was going on. So that's just a little bit of um, some of the stuff I did. And then what's that got to do with the zoo? How did I go from being a transportation ecologist dealing with federal agencies and protected species and then into um, the zoo and being the education manager. 
Um, and one of the things I will say is that a lot of the time while I was at the Department of Transportation, I spent probably 40% of my time educating because the designers and the maintenance workers and the project managers and all of the people who are doing all of the transportation projects are looking at you like, well, why do you care about this bat? Or why do I need to change how I've designed my road because there's a water there? So I spent a lot of time educating them about why it was, why those resources were important, and quite frankly, the laws surrounding why they needed to do it the way they needed to do it. And then moving on to the zoo, I'm going to try to do something interactive here. So we're going to see if this works. This. So if you all could go to the website that I've listed below, um, and it should show up here too. Um, and first, my question, because I always ask this question, is have you been to the zoo, the Virginia Zoo? You can answer yes, no, or I had no idea there was a zoo in Hampton Roads. Kim, <laughs> gonna call you out there. No, that's totally fine. <laughs> that's absolutely fine. I and it's funny, it's so funny because I've I've been to Hampton Roads like I you know normally go like twice a year for for these events. Um, I don't know if it's working, so. I apologize. I'm trying to do that. Oh, hey, I have answered. one. <laughs> you answered. <laughs> All right. One has been and one had no idea there was a zoo in Hampton Roads. Two. Yay. All right. So we'll see if this next one works because I know it's a, it, this is kind of a, a hard format. Um, to do this in. And I will say that, especially as an informal science educator, I am used to doing a lot of um, the Socratic method. So I don't really like to lecture as much. Um, so this is a little bit more out of my wheelhouse. Um, so then the next one, and did all of your screens switch as well? Okay, great. Um, so what word or words come to mind when you think of a zoo? Although if I'm being honest, it's because I live in DC, so. <laughs> this, this is true. And you have a fantastic zoo. <laughs> yeah, I know, we got pandas. <laughs> we have red pandas. <laughs> Ooh, I do love red pandas. And the ones of the Smithsonian are, are never out, which is fine, that's their, that's their choice, they're able to do that, but I always get a little bummed. Yeah. All right. Well, I will say I am really excited to see the word conservation. And I think it's because I have a group of teachers here um, and science teachers at that, because a lot of times when I do this, I get family and entertainment and fun. And a lot of times I don't even hear education. In fact, when I tell people who have nothing to do with science, probably seven times out of 10 that I'm the education manager at the zoo, they say, oh, you do education there? So I'm really happy to see all of those answers. Um, and so maybe what I have to tell you won't be as uh, revolutionarily groundbreaking as it is sometimes to some people. Um, but so this is just a little bit, the Virginia Zoo, yes, it is about animals. It is, I saw captive breeding. We're gonna, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, species survival plans. Um, it is about animals. It is about visitors. It is about engaging and educating and connecting all of that. But also it is about more than that. So at the Virginia Zoo, our mission is that we are committed to engaging our community in taking action to save the world's wildlife and their ecosystems because we envision a world where everyone values wildlife and the environment. And to do that, it can't just be teaching you a fact about an animal. It's gotta be making that connection and turning engagement into action. And that's really what the modern day zoo is about, is it's not just a place of 
animals. It's a place of promoting the highest welfare that we can and wildlife contributing to wildlife conservation, to education, to science, and to diversity and inclusion as well. Um, and the AZA, which I said before, we are an AZA accredited institution, is a regulatory body um, that uh, um, puts out an accreditation for zoos. And it is considered the gold standard of animal welfare and sort of that gold standard of zoo. And it, it is something that everyone has to, who is accredited, goes through every five years. Um, we got our accreditation back in 2018. We will be going through the process again in 2023. Every year they use the most recent science in looking at animals. They use the most recent science in um, talking about education and engagement and the, so the social science there. Um, and we're then really taking a look at, are you living up to all of that and to those standards? Some of the conservation programs that the AZA does are one, the species survival plan. Um, and that is someone said, talked about breeding programs. Um, I like to compare the SSP to ancestry.com meets match.com. So you are taking a look at the genetics of the animal as well as taking a look at the personalities. Are they going to match there? Um, and that is something that is um, a little bit of a fail safe towards extinction um, and really taking a look at making sure that we are being able to continue species, but that we're doing it, you know, genetically um, in a sustainable manner as well. Um, we also participate in something called SAFE, which is saving animals from extinction. And as the education manager um, at the zoo, I actually got to participate in one of the SAFE programs, creating the program for monarch butterflies. And we are a program partner. We are one of the signatories on it um, through all of AZA. And some of the things that we're doing are building more habitat at the zoo for monarch butterflies um, and also participating in some community science. So I'm gonna talk about that in a minute as well. And then we also do conservation. So a certain percentage of um, the zoo's budget every year goes to conservation and we have a specific conservation fund. And this is really where I am able to take my unique um, sort of background in being a field ecologist, melding with the education side of things. And I currently chair our conservation committee at the zoo. And so whenever someone comes to us with a project to say, we'd like to fund this, or do you want to get involved? Our conservation committee takes a look at it and we're taking a look at it to see, is this something that matches with our mission? Do we feel that the science behind it is sound? And do we feel like it is incorporating one of the biggest things we look at, especially for our international projects is, is it taking a look at the indigenous people and um, coordinating them into those efforts as well. Um, so that's something that tr traditionally we've done a lot of giving of money for our conservation fund. Within the next several years, we have a real push to not just donate the money, but actually be boots on the ground with our staff as well. And that's something that I am spearheading um, as that background with my, as an ecologist. Um, so I'm pretty excited and proud um, of the work that we'll be doing moving forward with that. And then community science at the zoo. And a lot of you may have heard it called citizen science. Um, it's around the um, community. We're really looking at getting away from the word citizen because that can be exclusionary um, and using that word community. And so that is taking those um, you know, non-trained scientists teaching them how to collect some data, um, or in the case of the Monarch Watch, we went out on grounds and we um, caught butterflies and tagged them. Um, so scientists are tracking their movement into Mexico. Um, for Frog Watch, we go out to areas around the 
Um, Hampton Roads First Landing State Park is one of our areas and are surveying the frog populations. And it's really just taking a look at what's there and scientists use that data to sort of monitor what's going on. The same thing with Caterpillars Count. Um, that's a project through the University of North Carolina. And we use our um, grounds, the some of the 54 acres that we have to monitor um, the invertebrate populations there to help them with their research. Um, and then City Nature Challenge is one that we helped to start last year. It's a big bio blitz. We didn't have any locations um, on our site last year. We're hoping that within the next couple of years, we might be able to have some more native habitats that we'll be able to participate and actually be a site as well. Um, but we did train people in how to do it. And if you're interested, uh, that's we get some ways to get involved. Um, so just a couple ways to get involved with the zoo is first off, education programs. Obviously I'm the education uh, manager, so I'm gonna plug that. Um, and especially for all of you teachers in Hampton Roads, I wanna let you know that this year we've had some amazing corporate sponsors. Um, ADP, which is a local, um, has a local company here and several of their uh, member or several of their people are on our board um, and they have been very generous to allow us um, to, I think they are funding, it's about 50 programs this year. Um, and then we have a couple other grants that have funded some other programs as well, um, including uh, Virginia 811 has given us some sponsorships too, um, to cover the cost of programming for public school teachers in Hampton Roads. And if you are interested in that, that QR code down at the bottom there will take you straight to a form to fill out. And we're trying to, catch as many people as we can. So please share that, please spread that. So please be in touch with me. Uh, I think we've got some great things going on. Um, and then for all of you in sort of the eighth grade or high school, we have our teen volunteer program. And that is a con the conservation youth team. And it's both youth development and volunteer. Um, and we do things within summer and the school year, but one of the great benefits is that if they volunteer with us the very first summer, they reach their 100 hours that they often need for the National Honor Society or other things. Um, so that application is coming open December 1, and it's going to close February 28th, and it does require, um, we ask for some teacher recommendations as well. So putting that out there in case you get anyone asking about it. Um, and then please go to the website and learn a little bit more. And then we have adult volunteer opportunities as well. Um, we have our zoo crew, which is our adult volunteers, and they work in education and interpretation. Um, they help with a sort of administration and operations. We have a lot of very dedicated horticulture volunteers. So if you really love gardening in your spare time, we have 54 acres uh, and we have a lot of gardens. And then animal care and conservation. Um, so doing some of those community science projects is something that our volunteers do. And then we also have just started what's called our episodic volunteer program, which is for individuals and families who are looking to pitch in on some special projects like some of our community science initiatives. Um, we also adopted the Lavalette kayak launch in Norfolk from Keep Norfolk Beautiful. And about twice a month we go out there and I'm proud, but also really sad to report that we often pick up like a hundred pounds of trash each time because I wish it wasn't happening every a month, um, but we're out there doing that. Um, and then we've also been working with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation and the Elizabeth River Project on a couple of different restoration projects that we invite people to come and get involved with us up as well. Um, so doing that hands-on conservation work. I have a question. So could you, and because only the, I love, like, I'm a huge fan of the AZA, um, mostly because it really changed my perspective on what zoos could do. Um, when I grew up going to like the Buffalo Zoo, which is a very sad zoo. And I guess, so I don't know if you could speak to in some ways, like, because I know one of the things that's really big and that was really important to me um, when I was thinking about zoo stuff mm -hmm. was the idea that, um, you know, just like the animal exhibits themselves and like, you know, yeah. the, some of those things. Because I think it's really, it's, I think it's really interesting. Absolutely. Um, and I will say that I've had a number of teachers who zoo exhibit design is a great STEM project. Um, and we do it in our camps. Uh, and it's 
uh, for our middle school camps. Um, and I worked with a fourth grade class at Kings Grant Elementary School last spring uh, doing one of theirs as well. It's a great PBL um, for anybody who's interested in that. But one of, I think what Kim is getting at is if you think of a zoo from 50 years ago, you think of a sad animal sitting on concrete and that's about it. That's a, that's a lot. Um, and so when I talked about the modern zoo and that the, the modern zoo must do better, um, that's one of the things we've really learned. And today, especially if you go to our zoo, you go to the Smithsonian um, or a lot of the, any of those AZA accredited institutions, um, it's exhibit design really has to consider the natural look of things, consider the animal wel welfare, which includes enrichment opportunities. Um, enrichment is something that helps to promote and stimulate those natural behaviors. So for us, if you've been to our zoo thinking about the orangutan exhibit, we have that vertical space and we've got a whole lot of area for them to climb in that climbing structure. Um, Kim up at the National Zoo, you guys even have that- you Got the O-line. O-line, that is amazing. And they even have, I mean, you have the like interactive computer and tablet and they can like touch things which really stimulates an ape. That's very important for the apes. Um, and so it's really taking into consideration the size and space, but also what types of things are needed to provide that sort of different interactiveness. And then also making sure you've got plenty of choice to give the animal so that they can choose if they want to go inside or outside or be somewhere hidden if they don't want to be seen or be somewhere out. Um, so choice is very important in exhibit design. Awesome, thank you. No, I see, I went and looked it up because I was curious because I went to the Lincoln Park Zoo in Chicago one time. Yeah. And they must have changed some things because I remember when I went there, I was like, oh, those are some sad exhibits. <laughs> um, but they have, like, they, they look very nice now. <laughs> yeah, no, it's been like, uh, ooh, it's been at least like seven or eight years since I've been to Lincoln Park Zoo. So yeah, and I was like, I was like, man, can't be, they're AZA accredited with those with those cages, but they must have uh, improved things. Could you kind of like explain like what's uh, what drew you to like ecology, I guess? Like anything in particular? Yeah, I've always been interested in the natural world, but I started out environmental science and chemistry major in college. And then I spent a semester in Australia, the School for International Training, which instead of just going to um, like a class or a regular university, their whole thing is it's a field studies based program. Um, and you go out and are actually in the environment learning a lot about it. Um, and you have to do a project on your own. Um, and I studied ants um, and beetles while I was there and sort of looking at some fire ecology and I got a professor to sponsor me. And that just, I never looked back after that. Um, it was all about bugs and the creepy crawlies at that point. <laughs> awesome. And so I just have to real quick, because I think it's actually caught, it's, I personally think it's funny, you guys might enjoy this. I one time, I used to, I used to work with um, African refugee and immigrant kids and I took them to the zoo one time Heather, this because your comment reminded me of this. And um, someone came up and they were like, oh, have you ever seen a millipede? And like, I had a kid with me and he was like, oh yeah, no. He's like, we used to farm millipedes. And like, <laughs> it was so wild to have this kid tell this, like, you know, adult volunteer who clearly knows what she's talking about. Like, yeah. he's like, no, no, I know what, let me tell you something about millipedes. Uh, but it was just a really, it was a hilarious interaction. Um, and they makes me, you know, really appreciate, I guess, zoo staff, because they're just, they were like, oh, I'd love to hear more about this. Um, so I think that's all the questions we have. Um, thank you so much, Michelle, for presenting. If we were in person, we'd all clap for you. Yay. Mm -hmm.